So, we're going to do Romans chapter 1 today, but there's a context to it. And I, last time I spoke, I asked everybody to write out a question that you would like to ask Jesus if you had a chance to one-on-one -on -one sit with him and ask him any question you wanted. And I, I received at least 16 questions. And um, I was impressed that the answers to most of the questions come from Romans. So we're going to do the book of Romans, um, Lord willing at least, um, we're going to try to do it. My goal is to try to make it meaningful and applicable to those who are the youngest in our midst who have the capacity to reason and understand to some minimal degree. So I'm not hoping to be overly exegetical in terms of teaching the fine doctrines of Romans. Uh, it's my opinion, and I believe I've heard some others say it as well. Romans is probably the most foundational epistle regarding our faith that is recorded, and it has a substantial amount of, in, of information about all kinds of topics, and hence when I read all the questions people had, I recognized most of the answers could easily be found in the book of Romans in some way, shape, or form. But as we go through Romans, the, the, the theme of the book of Romans is going to be asking the question, are you a Christian? And you say, are you going to ask that question every week? And I hope, I hope to ask some aspect of that question every week because it's imperative that you reflect on yourself and your life and your own responses in this life to the things that uh, are around you to be responded to. So on the screen, I'm, I hopefully will leave that on the screen for weeks to come, but there's a, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 that simply says this, examine yourselves to see if you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves that how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobate? And so here's something that we have a problem with as humans, and that's criticizing other people. It's a lot of fun to criticize other people. Two people can kind of chummy up next to each other and talk and chummy up and point out people's faults. And it's a really common human trait, human activity. But it's demonic from the beginning and it's demonic in the end. And so in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians, Paul turns the table. He's been responding to his critics through, throughout the whole book. It's the most masterly uh, response to critics that I've ever seen written in scripture. It's impacted my life enormously. But he turns the table in chapter 13 and says, how about you, them and yourself? Are you in the faith? And then he asked, he, he kind of gives this really interesting snapshot at the end. Though you're not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And how many of you can answer the question, what's a reprobate? Anybody know what the question, what is a reprobate? Well, I can see we're all chicken little. What's reprobate? Well, the word reprobate at its first ring always sounds like something that is um, really bad. Somebody that's like really, really bad. But in reality, the fruit of a reprobate is really bad. But what a reprobate is, it's a very interesting term. It's a monetary term. It's a term used in, in fiduciary matters back in the days when money was weighed out instead of pulling out little paper dollar bills saying, here's some money. You actually had to bring money by weight and you had to pay for something by the weight of the money. Well, as we heard in the communion message, by the time of Jesus' day, there were coinages, there were coins that were approved by the Roman emperor and 
Jesus could identify, have the Pharisees identify whose image was on the coin. But still, money was measured by weight. And so if you had a coin, it was often called a shekel. Well, a shekel is a measure of weight. And a reprobate coin was a shekel that somebody, when nobody was looking, took their little file in the silversmith shop and nobody's looking, right? And they just really shave off a little fine bit of the silver dust and get it into a pile. And then they would have a coin that was reprobate. It was lacking that which made it the full measure of a coin. And so um, I used to think, well, you probably can't shave off too much. And there's verses in the Bible that condemn that kind of activity. But uh, my wife and I were on one of our little anniversary getaways once to Williamsburg and we happened on the silversmith shop and I remembered this verse or the, uh, this term reprobate. And so I said, well, you're working on silver all the time. Um, do you have silver dust? And I, and I noticed that the desk or the, the workbench of the silversmith was a waffle top desk. Now by waffle top, I mean, instead of a flat surface that's smooth, it had boards, they were, they were thick boards, maybe one inch boards, um, maybe like a bunch of two by fours turned on their side. And, but it was waffled together, so you could work on something, but all the dust would fall into the cracks and be collected. So I asked a smart aleck question, which I like to do. I said, so, is that dust worth much? And I was astonished by the answer of the silversmith. Oh yes, that dust is the most important part of our business because we receive more profit from selling the dust than we do from selling all of the jewelry that we make out of silver. And I was astonished. So here's the deal. A reprobate coin is lacking the totality of what makes it an authentic shekel or coin by weight. And Paul's asking a question here about you examining yourself in the faith. He says, examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith, prove your own selves. Now, that's a nice challenge, okay? And if I could walk up to you, can you prove? Can you prove? Can you prove? Can you prove you're a Christian? Can you prove you're in the faith? And many times we might even have been trained with a, an answer to give. But when he goes on, he says, don't you know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? except you be reprobate. So I want to ask this morning, are you a Christian or are you a reprobate Christian? A Christian who claims to be a Christian, a Christian who participates in Christian activities with other Christians, a, a Christian who wants to be known by others as a Christian, but in fact they're lacking that essence of quality that actually makes them a Christian in reality. They're missing Christ in them. And we know from scripture that when we say Christ in you, we're speaking of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came back down, and now those who are Christians have Christ in them. Now, here's the issue. I want parents to pay close attention. I am not up here today trying to create all kinds of doubt and worry and fear in your children as to whether they're a Christian in some sort of false sense of the way. Neither am I trying to hold myself up as the one who's able to do the measuring as to whether you're a Christian or not. I don't believe that we can do that. Paul says, the Lord knows them that are his. So when we engage in Christian conversation, we have to simply preach what the scripture says. If you name the name of Christ, then depart from iniquity. And if you're struggling with departing from iniquity, then you have to ask a question, am I a Christian or am I reprobate? So a reprobate Christian is someone who claims to be a Christian, but who lacks the indwelling spirit. 
if we looked at this entire concept fully, we would discover that the only evidence that you are a Christian at all is that you have the Holy Spirit. You have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you have that voice of the Holy Spirit crying in you, Abba, Father, and you have that joy of the Holy Spirit bubbling out of you because the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. And that's a factual actual. When the Holy Spirit's present, he always is present in the fullness of God's holiness and the fullness of God's love and in the transformation of my heart attitude and power. Now, I could say that's the message, now go home. But I would like to do a, a little bit of thoughtful perusing of scripture here as we go forward. So I do have these things that are on the screen in the bulletin and I there's also pages for you to take notes or draw pictures <clears throat> now what I'm reading now this is some a, a glean from several readings from Oswald Chambers this week but I just thought it all fit together well and uh, let's meditate as we go through it one of the tests of determining if the work of salvation is genuine is has God changed the things that really matter to you now, this particular passage that Chambers was referring to was from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Behold, if we're in Christ, we're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so here's the test. Has God changed the things that matter to you? That's a good question. Now, if you answer that question that you're not sure, then that's an honest question. That, that's an honest answer. And I, I want us to understand one thing. These questions are to challenge the, the fundamental question of whether you're a Christian or not. They're not meant to create uh, uh, some kind of a, an appropriate reign of terror where you're trying to please Mr. Cox or somebody else's uh, viewpoint of whether you're a Christian or not. The Lord could care less if I think you're saved or not. He knows if you're his. And he knows that you're his in such a fashion that he's come into you by the Holy Spirit and you're in his life and his life is in you. But anyway, going back to the screen here, if you still yearn for old things, it's absurd to talk about being born from above. You're deceiving yourself. Now, I apologize for this, but this is an announcement of truth from the years of experience I have as a pastor. I have seen so many young people baptized from the early ages, you know, seven, eight, nine, or whatever, to older ages, teenagers, getting ready to go out of high school. I've seen so many young people baptized, give a little verbal testimony. But in reality, they have no visible evidence. Their hearts are hard, and the primary mode of operation in their heart and mind is they want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, and they want everybody to conform to it and to approve of it, and then they're happy. If you're born again, the Spirit of God makes the change very evident in your real life and thought. Um, now, please understand what we're talking about here is the change by the Spirit of God. If you're a child like I was, as soon as I would hear something like this, I would try so hard, ever so hard, to make it happen because I so wanted it to be true, I so wanted it to be true, but it was all in my own effort, it was all of my own energy, and that is not what being saved is all about. We don't have the power, we don't have the capacity to make changes, the Holy Spirit does, and so that's that source of life, and we learn to look to it and to depend on it and to rest in it. Now, this next term, this is, this is an old English term from just prior to World War II. We don't talk like that now, but today we call it the world. But civilization is based on principles which imply that the passing moment is permanent. Now, what does that mean? Well, when something's permanent, we treasure it and hold on to it and cling to it. And when something's not permanent, it's temporary, we quickly are willing to discard it. And yet, our civilization tends to act like all of the things of this life which are just temporal and passing away like they're permanent, and they're not. They are not permanent, they are only being in process if perchance we have the chance to use them in the power of the gospel, wonderful. 
but they themselves are passing and not permanent. The only permanent thing is God. And if I put anything else as permanent, I become atheistic. I like that. Now he's talking about it in terms of practical application. And so he's thinking of you and I as Christians making more of things than we ought because we make them more important than they are in the eyes of God and in the time frame of God. And so we become atheistic. And it's important that we understand when we go into Romans 1 today, we're going to talk about idols. And we're going to talk about how people made idols. And they substituted idols for God. And you're going to look at me and you're going to say, but Mr. Cox, we don't have idols come to our home and look. You'll not find a statue on a pedestal and you won't see us praying to it or worshiping it or, or putting little bits of food for that God to eat. We're not idolaters, but you are. As long as you maintain your own personal interests and ambitions, you cannot be completely aligned or identified with God's interest. Now that's hard to hear, but it's the truth. What do you really, 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 really want with your life? What, what do you think would really, really, really make you happy? Whatever that is, that is not something that would really, really make you happy unless your happiness is completely aligned with whatever God has for you. Now, I was quite impressed. I was quite pleased with the fact that I got quite a good number of responses uh, from your hearts, and it meant a lot to me, and I'm praying for you, praying over it, and this series in Romans is springing from the gleanings of your heart's desires as you expressed them to me. But <clears throat> listen to this next phrase. This can only be accomplished by giving up all your personal plans once and for all. What does that mean? How do I do that? Giving up all my personal plans once and for all? What does it mean? One of the, one of the questions seemed a little bit puzzling. I said, well, if I'm supposed to surrender everything, how do I obey? As if, to under, as if to imagine that surrendering everything meant to just empty yourself and just be sitting there like a doofus, waiting for something to move you other than yourself. But surrender of our plans, once and for all, is an exchange. I want my plans to be set aside here, and I want God's plans. And that's hard, and, we can, and if we'll think about it, if we have any testimony at all, each of us will have a testimony of something that was very near and dear to us that we desired and wanted and hoped for and pursued and planned on. And then God got a hold of us and he had us put away. Uh, the, the, you've probably heard this little story, but I'll say it really quickly in passing. Um, before I came to Christ, I had reached this plane of cr point of crisis, like what in the world's my life's purpose? What am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? And I had no clue. And I remember some friend of mine in high school had said, well, I think the purpose of life is to be happy. Well, that sounded a little bit like, well, yeah, it shouldn't be the purpose of life to be unhappy. So I asked myself a question in this unhappy state of mine. Well, what really makes me happy? What really makes me happy? And what really made me happy at that time in my life was playing basketball. I love playing basketball. and. I decided, well, that's it. I'm going to dedicate my life to basketball. And I made, a, I made a decision to become a professional basketball player. And my whole world was going to shape around that. I'm going to be a basketball player. And I did a lot of things that were real practical. The most important thing is, back in those days, it's a huge, huge expense. I spent $90 on a pair of tennis shoes so that I would have good quality shoes to play basketball in. Anyway, I got born again. And the most amazing thing happened. The preacher didn't tell me. People who knew me didn't tell me. I'm actually living by myself at this time. The Holy Spirit told me, uh, you know those basketball shoes you bought? You know that basketball career you have in mind? That's not what I have for you. I want you to put that away. And it was the Holy Spirit talking to me. And you know what I did? I literally picked up my shoes and I had a closet that had a deep, dark back recess that you could lose stuff in. 
And I went to the farthest back part of the closet and stuck my shoes there because I wanted to follow Jesus. Once and for all, allowing God to direct his purpose in your world. Your understanding of your ways must be surrendered also because they are now the ways of the Lord. That's a hard one, understanding of my ways. I, I, I thought that we were supposed to work hard and be diligent and then we'd get rewarded and we'd get this and that and the other thing and success would come out of our hard work. Well, our understanding has to be surrendered. It's not going to happen according to your understanding. What's going to happen is according to God's purpose and God's understanding, and he's going to use you because he knows how you were made. Now, here's a little understanding. I know you've all heard this story before, but it's just helpful. I wanted to be a missionary to Africa from the time I was a little kid. That's all I ever wanted. And I understood in terms of my understanding that it's good to be a missionary. It's good to have a sacrificial life, and it's good to go help the dying pygmies in Africa come to know Jesus. So that was my motive. However, when I was in Bible college and I had all these missionaries from Africa come and speak and they would tell of the need in Africa, they would also tell this part of the story. By the way, if God doesn't call you to missions, would you stay home? We don't want you. You're going to ruin our lives. You're a pain when you get over there because you have no idea what it means to follow God. You just have your own idealistic understanding and it's so hard to live with you. So please don't come to Africa unless God called you. So that's pretty clear. And I prayed, oh God, please send me to Africa. And he kept saying no. And actually it wasn't until a couple years ago that I began to realize that <clears throat> I was never qualified or equipped to be a missionary to Africa. Had I ever gone, it would have been a catastrophe. And all the missionaries would have hated me. And I would have ruined everybody's life. And I'm so glad I didn't go. But I must learn that the purpose of my life belongs to God and not me. That's a hard lesson. The purpose of my life belongs to God and not me. Ouch, that hurts. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. You all remember the story how I ended up in Frederick, right? I just so much wanted to serve the Lord. I so much wanted to serve the Lord. I just said, please send me somewhere. And I kept trying for this and that. And the Lord kept closing doors. And I finally screaming at God literally in the stairwell. Lord, I'll show you. I'm going to serve you whether you like it or not. <laughs> Scream that in the stairwell and have it echo in your ears for a couple hours. It'll work on you. I suddenly realized what a stupid thing that I could demand of God to let me serve him in some way that pleased me. And so the result of my screaming in the Lord's ear was a repentance. And I said, okay, Lord, I, I give up. If you want to take my life, water it up like a piece of paper, throw it in a trash can. If that brings you glory, then I give it to you. I give up all my expectations. And it was a relief of a burden. That's hard. I, I, some of your questions mentioned how hard it is to trust the Lord, how hard it is to surrender. Yeah, it is. It's really hard. And like some of you said, but it's even harder not to surrender because you're not smart enough <laughs> to begin with. You're not smart enough to know what is it that God has for you. What, what is it that will make you uh, useful and what joy you'll have in trusting the Lord in those useful things. All our fears are sinful. Can you get that? If you need to mark it down, we'll come to that in Romans 14 eventually. All your fears are sinful. <sighs> we live in a world of a lot of stress, and the stress is usually generated by some element of our fears. And all of our fears are, are sinful. Now, that, that being the case that our general makeup is that we're sinners, I understand, but the question is, uh, we often create our own fears by the, refusing to nourish ourselves in the faith. Now, when I try to get you all to do that calm box to think about yourself, what I'm really asking is just to think about yourself. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? What, what are you feeling? What do you want? What do you think you want? Because the reality is, faith always has to do with focusing on God's purpose, Per focusing on God's plan for you and not 
your understanding of God's purpose or your understanding of God's plan. And so it is very easy to nourish fear instead of faith because we're holding dear to our little desires. I want to before I die, I want to do this, I want to do that. How can anyone who is identified with Jesus Christ suffer from fear and doubt? Now that's a pretty strong, typical Oswald Chambers statement, but think about it. If you're identified with Christ, how can you suffer from fear and doubt? Now, let me explain. The temptation to fear is our human nature. That's, you're going to have temptations to fear. The question is, are you going to pay attention when you see that fear rising, and are you going to pause, and are you going to deal with it? Are you going to deal with that fear and replace it with faith? Are you going to come to that place of your most terrible fear and say, Lord, if I die, I die. I'm going to trust my life. I'm going to trust my case just like Queen Esther, and I'm going to let you have control over my life. And if you choose to put me down, I receive it. Because your plans are always best. That's the tough part, and that's the part of victory, though, in every part. We are identified with Christ. And so we surrender to his good purpose. Now, sometimes we get to see how God uses us in somebody else's life. And that's always special. That's always a treat to realize God used me. But many, 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 many times, and in fact, in the bigger picture, most of the time, you'll never really understand how God has used you until we get to heaven. Because the places where you're going to be most impactful on other people's lives is when your simple obedience and faith is in the Lord and you're not living like the rest of the world and somebody who is is going to notice it and you're going to impact their life. You may or you may not get to see the fruit of it. Our lives should be an, I, I love this part, the closing part. <laughs> Our lives should be an absolute hymn of praise resulting from perfect, irrepressible, triumphant belief or faith, if you please. That's the nature of our life. That's what pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But when you're walking in faith, it's a wonderful hymn of praise to him as we trust him in every moment of every hour. Okay, so now we're going to... Okay, here's the memory verse. I might change this from week to week, but from Jeremiah 2. Uh, now, as we read this verse, I want you to think of a little bit of the context, okay? Children of Israel, they'd been in the promised land now for many, many years and they've walked in idolatry for the majority of that time. And this is God asking them a question. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Now there is a graphic picture of our understanding versus God's understanding. And when we're living by our own understanding, we're trying to save our water in these little cisterns of our making because we think that's what's really going to matter. And we don't realize that there's this hole in the bottom of our cistern that's going to keep leaking off that, that water. Can a maid forget her ornaments? Or a bride her attire? Now just think about that. You're, imagine a bride getting ready for her, her wedding day and she forgets to get dressed. She comes in her barn clothes to the wedding. Uh, that's atrocious. I, I don't think that's ever happened except maybe intentionally. They wanted to get married in barn clothes. <laughs> Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Listen very carefully now. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. My people have forgotten me days without number. Now, I want to say one little comment here, okay? <clears throat> How do you remember the Lord? How do you remember the Lord? Well, for me, the most helpful way of remembering the Lord is to come to the Lord 
by coming to his word, coming to the Lord aware of my fears that I'm struggling with, aware of the situations I'm in, and coming to the Lord and reading his word and letting him speak to me. I've been a Christian now nearly 50 years. It'll be 50 years in June. Christian, nearly 50 years, and I'm astonished at my age as I still continue to walk in the Lord. I have got to regularly come to the Word of God just for a fresh reminder of perspective. And here's the complaint of God. You might have lots of different kinds of questions, but so often people's questions result in one thing, and that is inactivity. I have questions so I don't pursue God. I don't seek His face. I said I complain and the complaints mount and my perspective of what God is teaching is inhibited and lost because I'm not in the word. My people have forgotten me days without number. So as we go forward, touch a tiny touch of history, the Old Testament was written for our learning. All of the Old Testament law and the Old Testament practices were set forth as things that those who love God do and the requirements of those, but they, were, but they all rested on the will of the human, which was insufficient. And so the necessity of a Redeemer was so pronounced so that we look for a Savior. Now we're going to go into the first chapter of Romans now. And I'm hoping I'm not going to take too long. I took too long on the introduction. But I have a little code on the screen, and I wrote it in red. Just It's not in red on your bulletin, sorry. So the title is, What Does It Mean to Be Saved? What Does It Mean to Be Saved and Lost? And there's a code here that I'm going to point out as we go through. But as we get to this place, I remember myself as a six-year-old. I went to first grade catechism class and the first question of the Baltimore catechism that we learned was who made you and the answer was pretty simple God made me and the second question of the catechism was why did God make you now in my childhood that was the first religious training that I had of any kind of formality. And the answer to that question was very simple. Why did God make you? Now, in my little tally, where's my tally? Um, I had the most, or, or, the, or second to the most tallies of people wanting to know why. People wanting to know why. Now, I want to make a, an, a comment about our desire to know why. When a human being asks the question why, they're attempting to put the information they're receiving into a grid of their understanding to help determine whether that information is right or valid. When David was sharing communion this morning, and he shared that story of the Pharisees, asking this question, should we obey Caesar or not? Jesus knew why they were doing that. He knew what they were up to. And so he presented the answer, though not answering the fool according to the folly, but answering the fool according to their folly. And he gave that perspective of there's things that belong to God and there's things that belong to Caesar and you're the one responsible for that process of making the decision and it put the why back on the ones who were wanting to rebel. So here's the problem. <laughs> I want to ask you a question and I want you to be honest with your answer. You're not going to have to say it out loud anyway. Um, do you have to know why for everything? Do you really? Do you really have to know why? Um, Are you capable of managing the why? So often if God gave us something, if, if God would give us an answer why at the point we're as asking it, we're not asking the why to bolster our faith. We're asking the why to filter 
our faith. I'm not sure whether I'm going to believe this or not until you satisfy me. And here's the, here's the little statement that I want you to understand as we go forward on the question of why and looking at the scriptures here. <clears throat> if your God is so small that you can understand the reason why, then your God is way too small. And you don't have God at all. You have an idol. You have one shaped and formed in your own understanding. And indeed, your understanding is reprobate, which we're going to come across in this chapter one. That is, it's without, it's lacking the fullness of what understanding requires. So let's admit from the front here, you're not qualified to understand why in the fullness of that term. It's not possible. And so you're going to have to replace satisfaction from an answer that you get why from. You're going to have to replace that instead with faith. Is God sufficient to be trusted in this matter that I don't have any understanding of? I don't know where it's going. I don't know why God would do this. Are you going to be able to trust God at that moment? That's the whole objective. And now we get to the discussion of what it means to be saved and lost. Now, <clears throat> Those of you who remember might know that the Reformation was begun from <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. And verses 16 and 17 upended the confusion of Catholicism as it was exhibited in the 1500s. But I want us to pay close attention. So I have on the screen the red word code. And the code is this. What is revealed and how is it revealed? Or what is the sin and how does God show his wrath for that sin? So in this chapter, as we go forward, we're going to see the word revealed twice. We're going to see it revealed concerning salvation and we're going to see it revealed as being used according to um, the, the wrath of God against sin. So let's go forward. Now, because the goal is to ask the question, are you in the faith? And because I am not particularly trying to dissect the whole entire volume, um, we're going to go relatively quickly on certain sections. And we're only going to get the context to keep us going. So Paul is the one writing the letter. And he begins by describing himself as a servant, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So everything we're going to be hearing about in this chapter and in this book is going to be focused on the gospel of God. And this gospel was promised before by the holy prophets in the holy scripture. And so by the time Paul was preaching, it was very well understood, the Old Testament passages that all referred to Christ and his redemption. And everything in the Old Testament, the holy scriptures, concerned Christ, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So verse 4 is imperative for us to understand. It's one of those questions you'll never get to answer why in terms of your human understanding, but it is a clear what. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. And so we have one fact of evidence that Paul introduces to explain everything that I'm telling you about this gospel has been codified and set down as absolute proof because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And you really have to understand that everything relating to the gospel centers around and hinges upon that point. Christ rose from the dead and the scriptures teach elsewhere he was the first fruits. And all those who believe in Christ, they also are going to be risen from the dead unto eternal life. Uh, Jesus also taught that the unjust were going to, are going to be raised from the dead as well. And they're going to be inheriting the judgment of eternal death. So by this Christ, who has been proven to be the Son of God, we receive grace apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So that's a fancy phrase, but that Paul's basically telling us his assignment. 
his job is to go around to all the nations preaching the gospel so that he might cultivate faith in other lands and other languages uh, and other nations that didn't know God and that didn't have the Jewish background as, as the Jews had in Jerusalem. Verse 6, among whom are ye called to Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, to the Roman believers who are professing, and he's writing it ahead of having seen them, grace to you and peace from our Father. I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, that's an interesting statement. And again, this is a question on whether or not you're a Christian. And I want to ask you a question. Has your faith ever been spoken about by others? Have you ever been an example of faith? So just by the way you've lived your life, you've manifested your faith, and others have told the rumor of how you have lived your faith. It's imperative that we understand that's the stellar mark of our testimony. That's the thing that thrills people around the world, to hear stories about people who are walking by faith and not by sight, walking in light of eternity and not in light of the temporal. And these Romans had that testimony. Now Paul talks very personally to them that he mentions them in their pray his prayers without ceasing. And he's asking God if at any length now he can come visit them and establish some spiritual fruit among them. Um, that is to be comforted together with a mutual faith, both you and me. And I'll just mention that really briefly. Christians alone can enter into a relationship with one another based on a comforting faith. When we go through a circumstance and we stand by faith and we survive and other Christians are going to be encouraged by it and other Christians are going to try to be an encouragement to us. So this, this whole nature of fellowship, if we're not fellowshipping in our, each other's mutual faith, if we're not paying attention to each other so that we can comfort each other by our mutual faith, we're not really walking in Christian fellowship. I don't mean, I don't mean to say this in any kind of um, unkind judgmental manner, but when Christians meet, let, let, me, let me rephrase it, let's make, make it a little more personal. When you meet other Christians and you spend time with them, what do you talk about? What's your focus? What's your interest? And that's a real telltale sign regarding the genuineness of your faith because if Christ means everything to you and you're with other Christians whom Christ means everything, then when you get together, it's going to be that shared Christ is everything to us that's going to be the basis of our comfort and our encouragement one with another. So he tells them he doesn't want them to doubt that he was planning to come because he's a debtor to everyone. Barbarians and the Greeks, wise and the unwise. So as much as is within me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. So that ends the little introduction. Then he begins with this two, this two uh, paralleled codes. So the first code comes up this way. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? See, shame has to do with what you will and won't speak of in circles that may or may not appreciate your own faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, God, of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now pay attention, it's the power of God unto salvation. The saddest part of Christian history, in my opinion, is the fact that we have succeeded in codifying practices of Christianity so that people can go through all the ropes and all through all the practices. They can be baptized, they can be confirmed, they can receive communion, and they can go through the whole life imagining that they're Christians because they participate in these external things and they've never yet tasted of the power of God. It's the power of God that's in the gospel and the power of God changes you from the person that you are, which hopefully we can talk about in frank terms, 
the person that you are is a sinner. You're a sinful person. Your basic nature is a sinful person. But the gospel is the power to salvation to everyone that believes. So he's talking about salvation. What does it mean to be saved? And the rest of this chapter, this is the only place where he's going to discuss what it means to be saved. <clears throat> so pay attention. Here's what it does. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And now we'll get more into this way down in chapter 8 of Romans, but it's important for us to understand simply this. God is righteous. When we believe God in any matter that he calls us to believe, and we believe what he says, and then we act according to that faith. In other words, belief, faith, and obedience are always together. We believe God and then we obey. Then what happens is what I do at that moment is righteous. And you and I can do righteous things. We can do righteous things if what we do springs from the faith that we have in God from clearly what is revealed in his word. And God calls us righteous at that point. And so in this discussion of righteousness by faith, we're, we're going to learn in this book a little more what that means. But here at the beginning, it's just an utter declaration. God gives us power to be righteous. So the righteousness of God is revealed. What is being revealed? The righteousness of God from faith to faith. So here's what happens. I can tell you about the righteousness of God. And in many respects, you could say that's what the Old Testament law did. It's told all about what the righteousness of the law is. But in terms of experiencing the righteousness of God, I cannot do that by my own will, by my own effort, by my own plan. I need this power of God to do what's righteous. So at every moment, at every moment, when you believe God in a matter and you obey accordingly, that faith that you have in your obedience, that becomes a righteous act of God. It might be imperfect to some degree. And there might be occasions where that imperfection is shown in other areas of your life for sure. But righteousness is revealed to your faith. When, you get to, when we get to Romans 8, we're going to discover that the nature of righteousness is such that <clears throat> when I am walking after the Spirit, then I'm going to complete the righteousness of God. Every time I respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, I'm responding in righteousness. I'm walking in righteousness, and I am not sinning at that point. The Holy Spirit can never sin. So this is a brief introduction. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the just simply meaning those who have their sins removed by the blood of Christ. And we live by faith. I, I lost something. There's a fresh missing from faith to faith. That's it. That's missing. Let me find it. Pardon? Is it on there? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's highlighted and I didn't see it. Thank you. It's on the screen. Righteous God is revealed. I focus on the revealed from faith to faith. From faith to faith. So here I am. I do faith. That's righteousness revealed. I do my own thing. That's sin revealed. I walk by faith. That's righteousness revealed. So the Christian life is a life where I'm learning to walk by faith, from faith to faith. Everything that I need to be is a step of faith. And when we get to Romans 14, you're going to discover if you didn't do it by faith, I don't care what you did. I have no bother, whatever you did. If you didn't do it by faith, it's sin. You don't get any credit for it. You get judgment for it. Now, if righteousness is revealed by faith, How is God's wrath revealed? Now, I have to ask, ask the question, how is God's wrath? Because the righteousness revealed by faith was plain, but the wrath of God is revealed, and it's not revealed yet. It's revealed against something. Pay attention. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So now we're going to see the flip side of faith 
we're going to see unrighteousness. And it's simply put this way. I don't mean this to sound crass or to demean you in any way. But if you're doing something by your own understanding and by your own preference, by your own knowledge, it's unrighteous. You don't have permission to live life as you please. It was not true if your mother told you when you were little, wait till you get to be an adult and then you can do what you want. Sorry, it's not true. You're never going to get that permission. <clears throat> so the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now pay attention because this isn't the revelation yet. This is where you have to catch the bigger picture of Romans 1. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. Now, I want you to be thoughtful for a moment. You are responsible for everything God shows you. You are responsible for everything that God shows you. You're to be paying attention when God is showing you whatever he chooses to show you, and you're to respond. That which can be known of God is manifest them, for God showed it to them. How does God show it to them? For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even as eternal power and as Godhead, so they were without excuse. Now, one of the dear questions that I received was about what happens to babies. And anytime you understand what uh, most Christians teach in the Bible about original sin, the Bible teaches, and we'll, we'll see this more distinctively in Romans 5, but the Bible teaches distinctively that we're all born in Adam's sin. And the proof that we're all born in Adam's sin is that Many times an infant will die before they've ever had a chance to do right or wrong, before they've ever have a, had a chance to believe or to rebel. So the evidence that we're born in sin is found in the evidence of death. Now, what happens to that child? What happens to that child? Now, the answer to that question, if I just gave you my opinion, you might be satisfied. But I hope that we can construct it together out of scripture because the answer is simply found in that last phrase, there without excuse. What makes you inexcusable? What can be known about God is clearly made known, being revealed by the things that were made. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and his Godhead. So here's something that I can say with, with a, um, clarity on the one hand and you're going to still have questions on the other. At what age are you without excuse? At what age are you without excuse? I was raised in a church that said a certain age, that you're not accountable until a certain age. And they chose that certain age simply because it seemed like a fair thing. Um, you're without excuse. <clears throat> now, I want you to be thoughtful and recognize that being thoughtful is a part of being a creature. It's part of your obligation to God. You have to be thoughtful. You need to think on the things that's going on. And so God is telling us that we're without excuse because if we've interacted with his creation, there's a revelation in the creation that is clear. And we can learn things about God from the creation. And the things that we can learn about God through the creation are enough to have every pygmy in Africa born again if they take the time to respond. Two things the creation teaches us. If you do any amount, I mean, first of all, you don't have to take in the whole creation. In fact, it's impossible to take the whole creation. But how about just 
taking in the creation nearest by you in the world that you live in. <clears throat> There's two things that stand out, God's eternal power and his Godhead. Now, eternal power is an interesting word. And this is a word that builds your faith, that builds your faith, eternal power. There's nothing that God can't do. There are some times in the scripture you can find those stories where God tells people through like the angel to Mary, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. He has eternal power. He can do all things. And we can gather that from the creation as we just observe how things function and how the power of God has caused all things to function. And so God is all powerful. He's all powerful. Now, the second thing about God that, this, that the creation teaches us very carefully, listen, you're without excuse. So I've been a teacher for many years. And as a teacher, I give out homework assignments. And then I collect the homework on the next class. And so many times there have been occasions where uh, I forgot my homework. I forgot my homework. <laughs> well, I want you to understand something. You're a creature of God, and you have a homework assignment. You're to find God through the creation that he's made, and you're to respond to him. You're without excuse if you don't recognize that God's all-powerful and then the Godhead. What is Godhead? His eternal power and Godhead. That little word there is a fancy word that simply means he is Lord of all. King of kings, Lord of lords, above, above, above and over all. He, he is and all things come from him and all things return to him. He's the one that has fullness of understanding, fullness of purpose. And my job is simply to recognize, oh, God's in charge. Now, here's the problem that you and I have as we're born into this world with Adam's sin nature. I want us to think just momentarily, I don't have any idea what ever really would have happened if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, and that's because God chose to make the world anyway in the foreknowledge that that man would sin. So in God's foreknowledge, he knew what man would do, and he instead chose to, instead of preventing us from coming into existence, he chose to bring us into this world so we might know salvation by his love and mercy. But that, that aspect of God's authority stands out in years of my life. He's the one in charge. I have an obligation to pursue this God. Now, I've had students tell me before, Mr. Cox, you didn't give us a homework assignment. And there are many, many people that could say in, in their own imagination and their own understanding, well, God, I didn't get your homework assignment. I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. And here's the point. I want you to understand something. You and I are will what? The number one question that we asked was why? <laughs> why? <laughs> I think that's astonishing that the number one question we ask is why? Because that reveals to us there's a little part of us where we would like to know what's going on. Is this all there is? Or am I part of a bigger plan? If there's a bigger plan, who's in charge? But the question is, Will you take the time to think about it? Listen very carefully. This is a hard passage to apply to you, and I want to apply it to you. And so there's a little phrase, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now, when is that point at which you can know God and have a departure from him? When is that point? And I'm going to have to say, God knows, I'm not going to be able to say, oh, age this or age that. God knows. And I'm, and I'm positive that it's at different ages for different people. But there is a time frame that God knows in your life when your capacity to ask questions sur surfaces. And the question is, what did you do with that? What did you do with that? Uh, there's tons and tons of things that we as parents do and try to do for our children to help them understand their need to be responsive and responsible to God. 
but still in the very end, God holds you accountable. Um, I used to worry as a child, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to be a missionary to Africa. I used to worry, well, how will the poor pygmies in Africa ever, ever get saved if somebody doesn't tell them about Jesus? And of course, the Lord has set forth Jesus to be the savior of the world. And he sent forth missionaries to do that. When we get to Romans 10, we're gonna visit this question again, but we're gonna recognize that this verse here in Romans 10 has something very much in common because in talking about the preachers and evangels being sent in Romans 10, this is what it concludes with. I say verily, have they not heard? Have they not heard? And the answer from Psalm 19, yes, verily, their sound has gone forth in all the world to the uttermost parts of the earth. And there's not a voice or language where the sound is not heard. And he's referring right back here to this recognition that God reveals himself in the creation. And the question is, how do you respond? Now, if I, forgive my foolishness, if I said to you, by the way, I've got this great field trip we're going to go on, and we're going to go to... Uh, an amusement park for a whole month and all we're going to do is play games and eat food and have a good time and we're just going to have fun, 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 fun. Would any of you want to come? I'm sure for at least half a second many of us would like to come. <laughs> we're, we're very, very prone to filling up our moment with some kind of jo meaningful joy that we imagine is joy at the moment. And that's where our problem lies because we would rather do something fun than to think about the purpose of life and why we're here and why things are so difficult and why do people have to die, et cetera, et cetera. So listen very carefully to your response that's lacking. The pygmies in Africa won't go, won't go to hell because they never heard about Jesus. The pygmies in Africa are gonna to go to hell because when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God and neither were they thankful. But instead they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Let's, let's think about that for a moment. This is that picture of the wrath of God being revealed from heaven they knew God, but they didn't glorify him as God, and neither were they thankful. So there's two attributes of God, his eternal power and his Godhead, and I should have outlined this with underlining here. And there's two responses to that God, glorifying him as God and being thankful. Now just think about that for just one moment. If you have an almighty, eternal, powerful God who's in charge of everything and overall, what do I have? I have somebody that I can look to with the most significant admiration and respect that we'd call worship. Oh God, what an incredible world you have made. I can't even imagine how you did it. Now when I was a child in ninth grade and I thought about this and I had just begun a little bit of science learning for the first time, I came across the thought and I haven't been dissuaded from it yet, but the harder we study science, and the more mysteries we unfold as we go deeper and deeper, the one thing that will happen is we'll cover, we'll keep discovering new horizons of how things work that are so beyond our understanding. When I took chemistry and biology in high school, we learned something called the, the systems, the body systems of the human body. When I began teaching biology, there was this more advanced thing called biochemistry, where it was taking life forms and how life forms interacted with the chemicals and the, the incredible compounds and life forms that were created by God. And that was just a touch. And now today, they, they know so much more of what's going on inside the cell, and it's a phenomenal thing, but we haven't touched the end of it. <clears throat> Imagine knowledge 
of the big spectrum out in the universe. We can't touch the end of the understanding of the universe. It's so far beyond our capacity. But go the reverse way, inward into the cell. Now, I'm taking uh, the science book's word for it, but it was a Bob Jones science book, so I believe it wanted to be true, if it probably was true. But it said, I want to, to compare our solar system, think about the distance of the planets from the sun. And just try to think of it spatially. Now, if you could reduce it to a model on paper, reduce it to a model on paper. <clears throat> now I want you to look at the, pers the, the, pers the percentage, the, the, per the perspective difference. Go inside a cell for the nucleus and all of the uh, different um, orbitings are occurring. I guess it wasn't a cell, it was an atom. And the, the space between the core of the, of the atom and the neutrons that are spinning, I mean the electrons that are spinning around, the space between that is greater in a percentage basis than the distance between the farthest planet and our sun just by percentage. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's mean ratio. So if you blew up one atom to be the size of our universe, the distance between the sun and the electrons would be far greater than the distance between the sun. Same way with a ball bearing. Did you know what a ball bearing is? What do you use ball bearings for? Very, very hard, very, very smooth. They're smooth for the purpose of rolling friction to prevent things from melting down with heat. Um, if you take a ball bearing and blow it up to the size of the earth, its mountains would be taller than the world and the valleys would be deeper than the world. That's just perspective. So anyway, we can never come to the end of this amazing understanding of who God is. And science is a form of worship, worshiping God. And the whole thing that it brings us to is awe and wonder. It's just an amazing thing. but. It calls for giving God glory. And not only that, it calls for giving him thanks. Now, giving God glory worships his power. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I, did that, I got that backwards. Giving God glory worships his Godhead. He is God. But giving thanks to God worships his, his sovereignty in terms of his purpose. He's able to do, and I find myself in a situation and here's the situation. Look at your life today. Fine, go ahead. Write all your grumblings and complaints of what you don't like and what you wish wasn't. Write them all down. Write them all down. Fine. But today, the question is, are you giving God thanks for your life? Are you thanking him? I didn't say, are you understanding why you're here and what you're doing and how come it's taking so long or whatever. The simple question is, are you giving him thanks? You give God thanks, you give God glory, and you find yourself at that place where you can walk by faith in your circumstances. So you can receive your circumstances instead of rebel against them. If a mighty, powerful authority in heaven gave me my circumstances, I can trust him in them and I can call on his name and seek his help. So look what happens, but instead of calling on God, instead of giving worship and calling on God, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Pay attention to the pygmies in Africa. They changed the glory of God, of the incorruptible God into an image made to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now this is an amazing thing. When you look at world history, the amount of idolatry, that's centered around either just um, superb qualities of manhood or the qualities of nature, the sun god, the river god, the, the wind god. In our foolishness, we make God in our own image. And so this is where we have to understand that when Paul says science so-called, science is real. But man abuses science to come up with his own God. And we, we find that in our world today on the right hand and on the left. But the question is, way back at verse 18, 
For the wrath of God is revealed. How is the wrath of God revealed? Here's how it's revealed. Verse 24. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Now let me just zero in here on a second, okay? The revelation of God's wrath is found in the debauchery of our will and the decisions that we make and how we live our lives. That's where the revelation is. God's saying, fine. Remember the word reprobate. <laughs> they have not the knowledge of God. It's removed. And so God simply said, fine. You want to live in a world where frogs are your gods? Go for it. And God pulled himself back from the active engagement with people who were walking in idolatry. And the fruit of our own understanding is this paralyzing, powerful force of sin sweeping over us on the right hand and on the left. Now, in my opinion from Romans 1, the crown jewel of that revelation appears to be homosexuality. And so he describes women changing their natural use, which is against nature, and likewise men leaving the natural use of women, men working in themselves. But listen very carefully, receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was fitting. So the wrath of God is revealed in the result of how I live my life. If I trust God, if I believe God, if I'm pursuing God, then he's going to be the centerpiece of my life and the consequence of that interaction with God is going to be I'm walking by faith, I'm going to be calling on his name, and I'm going to be walking in righteousness. But if I'm going on my own understanding, I'm going to, by my own understanding, diminish God. God's going to be diminished to a place of insignificance, and I'm going to make God in my own image. And so the consequence, the revelation of God's wrath to us is the debauchery we end up in. Just, now I switched here to the New English translation because it's a little simpler. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God. Pay attention, okay? Again, here's that foundation. The revelation of God's wrath is because when they knew God, they didn't worship him as God, neither were they thankful. They didn't see fit to acknowledge God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what not should be done. Now I want you to understand, you don't commit a sin and then become damned. Your committing sin is an evidence that you already have been damned. You have already pushed away God from your life, and so God's simply going to say, fine, you go ahead and have it your way. Live life like you want it. Use your own understanding. Now, the, the treacherous thing is, go back to the Garden of Eden for just a moment, chapter 2, excuse me, ch chapter 3, where Adam and Eve made that fateful decision to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You have to recognize that Satan was driving the narrative of unbelief. Now there were two trees in the middle of the garden. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the other tree was the tree of life. Had Adam and Eve partaken of the tree of life, they would have received eternal life in that process and they would have never died. Now, you remember the narrative, instead they take the fruit of the tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil. And what was the consequence that God, God drove them out of the garden? Why did God drive us out of the garden? Because he didn't want us to touch the tree of life. He didn't want us to be eternally damned in our sin. But just think about it. I don't know how long it was between the time of creation and, and, the, and the Satan's temptation through the serpent. I don't have any idea. 
the narrative doesn't give us much information. But I can tell you this much. They hadn't gone through the whole garden yet and tasted all the fruit. And most of all, they hadn't bothered tasting the fruit of life. They hadn't done it. And here comes Satan. And what does Satan tempt them with? He's not tempting them with the tree of life. He's tempting them with what you don't know. You might know more and you might be like God. Tempted him with knowledge. So when we took of that tree in Adam and Eve, we found ourselves in this debased situation where we rely on our own understanding. It is so easy for us to say why. There are times. There are times to say why, to be sure. But the times that we say why should never be in the circumstance where we recognize this moment calls for my faith, not for my understanding. Now, I've heard the most amazing story years ago about this um, amen brother who was an evangelist and I forget his name and the story was told in a rather charming way but there was a, a relatively ignorant uh, preacher who loved going from church to church doing revival meetings and he loved to tell stories about trusting God God answering prayer and etc and one time he comes to a small town <clears throat> and I think they called him amen Charlie because he was always saying amen and, and there was a bunch of young boys which are bound to be a part of any church uh, until they come to Christ that they spend all their time laughing and mocking and making fun of and they thought oh, amen brother amen so after the morning service the boys got together and said he's always praising God he's always thanking God he's always saying amen let's see how good he can do if we take away his distributor cap so he was driving a car, obviously, and a distributor cap is the device that distributes electrical charge to all the cylinders so you can fire and run. So he was the last one to leave the church. The boys had taken the distributor out and pulled away and hit it. And Amen Charlie comes out and can't get his car started. And so the boys are watching because they thought it would be so fun to mock him. So he lays his hand on his car. He says, oh, God, I don't have any idea why this car won't start. But you're God. You know how to do it. Can you fix it and make it run? That's all he prayed, and the boys heard him. And he gets, he gets back in and starts the motor and drives away. The boys were at the next town listening to a sermon <laughs> with a little different attitude the next time. But the picture is simply this. We're not called to punch through life with our understanding. Our understanding isn't going to be what wins the day. If you understand 10 things, do you know how many more things there are than 10? And what about 100 or 1,000 or 10,000? The point isn't you're saved by your understanding. You're saved by faith in the God who not only understands it all, but he made it all. So when you and I refuse to give God glory, to give him thanks in our circumstance, we're on the very edge of being shoved into a reprobate lifestyle, meaning where we live without the knowledge of God, and we're totally under the, domin the, domin the domineering narrative that Satan offers. And we keep thinking we know best, we keep thinking we're doing right, but all of this Satan, he gets you to do something for one purpose, what? To destroy you, not to save you, not to help you. <clears throat> so. Let's look at this list. I'll, 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 I'm really over. I apologize. They're filled with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, covetous, malice, rife with murder, envy, strife, deceit, and hostility. Gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, contrivers of all sorts of evil, I, I, someone asked me, it wasn't in this group of questions, but someone asked me, why is it that so many boys just love to sit around and plan how to be mean and hurt people? How come? They're walking in their own understanding. They're not walking in worship of God, and it just happens. If you don't have God as the mooring point of your, of your life, then you are, and the deception Satan brings you. 
So it's just a really horrible long list. Insolent, arrogant, boasters, contriver of all sorts of evil, anticipating to parents. Senseless. He stuck that in the middle there, disobedient to parents. So think about that. <laughs> disobedient to parents. Are parents perfect? They have to be obeyed in every way? Well, the scripture says this. You obey your parents in the Lord. But it is right. Just as you obey Caesar in the Lord, there's a part that's due to Caesar and a part that's due to God. Same with parents. But God put parents there for a reason. Covenant breakers, heartless and ruthless. And although they fully know God's righteous decree that those who practice those things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those that practice them. Brothers and sisters, I'm sad to say, I'm sorry to say that today we live in, a, in an American culture that at the highest court of the land has decided to approve such wicked practices across the board. We don't have a foundation of righteousness built on knowing God and walking by faith. We have a foundation that now we're allowed every perversion that the scripture points out and condemns. We're allowed every perversion and those who disagree are told to keep their mouths shut or be quiet, excuse me, or be punished. It's an amazing world that we live in and it's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any better. But I want to challenge you. Are you a mocker? Do you spend your time pleasing yourself? In private little humor? Do you practice that form of godlessness that God has nothing to do with anything that you do or say? That's who you naturally are. So the competition isn't between you and your parents or you and other people, the competition is between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And you're invited in. You're invited into the kingdom of God. And you need to recognize from the very beginning, and when we'll get through this as we get through Romans, you need to recognize we're people in need of redemption. God has provided it. But you must take willfully that step of calling on the name of the Lord. That's your job. And when you know to call on the Lord and you don't, God holds you accountable. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray that you would take these thoughts and help us all, help our young people to recognize the simple truth that you are God and there is none like you. And our call is to trust you, is to worship you, is to glorify you your name, to call upon your name in every circumstance that we're in, not leaning on our own understanding, but acknowledging you and looking for you to direct our paths. Pray that the clarity of the gospel and the transformation of Christ in us, the hope of glory, might be the fruit of the time we spend here in the word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.